The year is 2018. Ah. The silver screen has been graced with Henry Cavill reloading his fists, a shockingly mid Star Wars movie that never went anywhere, and one of Johnny Depp's worst performances of all time. No magic. Logan Paul went to a place and saw a thing, and it was bad. The world is falling apart all by itself without the help of COVID-19. <laughs> You come home from work or school Bueller. or some other mysterious place where balanced and happy people go and you fire up your chosen gaming platform. A lot of games released in 2018, but only two were ever really in the running for Game of the Year. Red Dead Redemption 2 and God of War 2018. I love both of these games. Most people can agree that they're both expertly crafted experiences in their own right, but I also assume most people will have read the title of this video before clicking on it, so you know where I stand. I think God of War deserved Game of the Year. Keep those Dorito-crusted hands where they are and swallow that mouthful of Mountain Dew you were about to spit all over your RGB mechanical keyboards and let me explain. So obviously it's not a very brave take, and I'm not claiming to be some hyper unique contrarian giving you forbidden arcane knowledge here, but I do see a lot of discourse surrounding these two games and their rivalry, even now in 2023. At the end of the day, a lot of the things I'm gonna say are my subjective opinion. That being said, I will settle the debate once and for all, so if you disagree, then I hope you enjoy being cringe and wrong, loser. I also want to preface all of this by repeating that I really enjoy both games. I've played them both multiple times, including replaying them for this video. They are fundamentally very different games. From their presentation, to their gameplay, to their structure, they're so different in so many ways. So while I'm going to do my best to compare them in ways that they can be compared and to provide evidence for my claims, any resolutions stemming from those comparisons are likely to be subjective as well. With all of that out of the way, let's get started with a brief overview of each game. God of War was released by Santa Monica Studio on April 20th, 2018 for PlayStation 4. The eighth game in the series overall, it served as a soft reboot for the franchise, changing setting, gameplay design, point of view, and even the character design for Kratos, the god of war himself. They departed from the Greek legends of the previous games and dived into Norse mythology, introducing a whole host of new characters, including Kratos' son Atreus and the greatest storyteller in the known universe. It delivers its narrative in a linear way, with Corey Barlog, the game's creative director, saying it's open, but it's not an open world. As of writing this video, it has sold over 23 million copies, which includes sales from its 2022 PC port. Now, I haven't played any of the previous God of War games, so I went into this one blind in terms of character and story. I can comfortably say that that didn't affect my enjoyment whatsoever, and I never felt like I was missing information that would have otherwise made the game better. As I'm sure you're all aware, it won a ton of awards, including Game of the Year at the Game Awards. It received many 10 out of 10s, a 9.75 out of 10 from Game Informer, and a 94 out of 100 from Metacritic. Wow, what a fucking disappointment. Red Dead Redemption 2 was released by Rockstar Games on October 26th, 2018 for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One as a prequel to Red Dead Redemption, which released in 2010. Following in the footsteps of its predecessor, it's an open-world action-adventure game, but it's more ambitious and well-realized in almost every way. We play as Arthur Morgan, riding with the Vanderlind gang in the Wild West, coming across many of the characters you see in the previous game, including protagonist John Marston, as well as gracing us with an insane amount of other wonderfully developed characters to save and insult and murder. At the time of writing, it sold more than twice as well as God of War, having sold over 50 million copies. Again, I haven't played Red Dead 1. That's possibly sacrilegious, but I think it works well for the sake of this video. Much like God of War, and possibly more so because this is a prequel, there's no prerequisite knowledge necessary to enjoy Red Dead 2. It also won a bunch of awards, received heaps of 10 out of 10s, but it got a perfect 10 from Game Informer, and a 97 from Metacritic. Yeah, take that Kratos, you little bitch. So now that we've given a brief overview of each game, despite the fact that if you clicked on this video you definitely didn't need it, let's dive into the first comparison, and one that naturally arises when you're talking about these two games in particular. 
God of War begins with Kratos cremating his late wife Faye, Atreus' mother, at their Midgard home. They burn her together, but we see that the father-son relationship is pretty distant and awkward at this point. Kratos immediately insists on taking Atreus to hunt, to train. They go out tracking deer and killing Draugr, not only teaching us the game's mechanics, but giving us further insight into how Kratos interacts with Atreus and what Atreus thinks of his stern and stoic father. We also get this line, Do not be sorry. Be better. Which is amazing. We get to fight a boss, and he's huge and badass, and I hope you like this design because you'll see it a lot. After we kill it, we get a little taste of Atreus' aggression and sickness too. So a lot happens in this little opening and we're not even done. This is around 10 to 20 minutes of gameplay we've got here and it's really efficient storytelling. It's exciting, it's intriguing, it's a little emotional. I'd say this is an extremely effective opening from a story standpoint, but as I said, we're not even done. Kratos decides Atreus isn't ready and dad and boy return home to gather up mum's ashes. It's here that things really begin, when Norwegian Jack Sparrow shows up to tell Kratos he reckons he's seen a few walkthroughs of God of War 1 to 3, and he'd like to have a calm, reasonable chat. Sadly, Atreus is hiding under the floorboard so he doesn't get to see the greatest WWE performance of all time, but we do learn that this stranger is basically unkillable. Baldur is blessed with invulnerability to all threats, physical or magical. It sets us up for the new Norse setting, gives us a villain to root against, and shows the incredible sense of scale that we'll see throughout the game. After the fight, Kratos knows he has to get moving, and despite telling Atreus he isn't ready, they set off to scatter Faye's ashes on the highest peak in the Nine Realms. Or so they think. Now I'd be here for hours if I went into depth describing every story beat of both games, so I'll summarise a little. We meet Brock on our way to the mountain, who is short and angry and also blue. Then we meet Freya after a classic hunting blunder, who is magical and lives beneath a turtle. She brings up another central part of the story. Kratos is a god, and so is Atreus, but the boy doesn't know that yet. Eh, surely what he doesn't know can't hurt him. We also meet Sindri, Brock's brother, who is significantly less blue and less cool. So we try to get to the top of the mountain, but there's a black cherry vape cloud blocking the way, and only the light of Alfheim can get rid of it. So, Freya helps us get Tyr's temple working again and takes us to Alfheim to find- Oop, bye. We clear some gross tentacles, have a dream about how shitty we are at parenting, and harness the light of Alfheim. More development of the father-son relationship, where Atreus accuses Kratos of not really grieving Faye's loss, and Kratos thinks about maybe starting to try being less of a shit father, then back to Midgard. But before we get there, Atreus tells us more about those voices in his head. Weird. We kill a dragon on our way up to the top of the mountain, get some cool mistletoe arrows, see some sinister folks that turn out to be the sons of Thor, see Balder, a son of Odin who we fought before, and meet Mimir. He kindly tells us that our princess is in another, taller castle in Jotunheim, which is really hard to get to. And for that pro tip, we promptly cut his head off. Freya resurrects him, and Kratos and Atreus find out she's a god and was Odin's wife. We chat with this guy, who leads us here, to get this. But not before we have a calm, reasonable chat with Magni and Modi, Thor's sons. We kill Magni, and Atreus gets so excited about it that he starts coughing up blood. Happens to the best of us, mate. Modi comes back to avenge his brother, and Atreus tries to use Spartan Rage, but he's underleveled, so we take him back to Freya for healing. She sends us to Helheim, where our axe will be useless, so we have to use something else instead. I'd like to pause the pace a little here to go into detail about this scene. As I said, I haven't played the previous God of War games, but I know about the Blades of Chaos, and I know how many gods he's killed, including his own father. There's a long shot of Kratos rowing home on the river, a storm gathering around him, the music swelling. When he finally chains the blades to his arms, he sees a vision of Athena saying he'll always be a monster. He agrees. It's such a powerful scene that gives us a meaningful insight into how Kratos feels about his past, his destiny, his son, and his legacy. This moment is treated with such reverence and gravitas that it feels like a real turning point in the story, and that's reflected in the gameplay. 
So we kill the bridge keeper, hey those are some familiar moves, and we take his heart. Mimir finds out who we are and what we've done and once again urges us to tell Atreus. When we take the heart to Freya, she agrees that he needs to know and tells us about her own son, one who was foretold to die a needless death, so she did everything in her power to protect him and he hated her for it. Kratos finally reveals he's a god and tells Atreus he is too. Clearly counter to what Kratos expected, Atreus is very excited about this and asks about his new superpowers. He talks about being a god all the way through Tyr's vault, where we learn about Ragnarok and Kratos gives Atreus a knife he made for him on the day he was born. He impresses upon Atreus the responsibility of being a god. They retrieve the Black Rune, which only reveals its secrets to Atreus, a bunch of glowing runes showing up on his skin. We're interrupted before we know what it says though, by these guys who seem really familiar, maybe I've seen them somewhere before. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. We see a cute bonding moment, which serves as a mini payoff for the relationship we've watched grow so far. <sighs> and then Atreus goes right back to being a shithead. We head back to the top of the mountain where we can get to Jotunheim, but meet a beaten and battered Modi along the way. Kratos tells Atreus to leave him alone, but the boy now has only child syndrome and a god complex, so he kills him anyway. He argues with Kratos and doesn't seem to show any remorse or comprehension of what he's just done. We get to the top and Atreus helps us open a portal to Jotunheim, but naturally, Baldur shows up to rock our shit. We fight and end up destroying the gateway. Atreus is high on his own godly supply and shoots us with a stun arrow to try and fight Baldur himself which gets him stabbed and kidnapped. We jump onto a dragon's back to keep fighting Boulder, who of course doesn't die because he is blessed with invulnerability to all threats, physical or magical. He threatens to bring the might of Asgard down on us. Instead, we open the Bifrost to Helheim and all three of us get sucked through. We give Atreus a huge dressing down, which thankfully seems to get through to him. Then we set off to get out of here. On our way, we see visions of past events and so does Boulder. It's here that we learn that Baldur is Freya's son and that part of her protection means that he can never feel anything again. Not pain, not pleasure, not death. We get on a boat to leave where we see a vision of Kratos killing Zeus. We find out that Tyr, the Norse god of war, hid away to get to Jotunheim from Odin. We also learn that Baldur is blessed with invulnerability to all threats. Yeah, yeah, I've heard this one. But seriously, we learn that Mimir can't talk about Baldur's state because he's been bewitched by Freya. We then perform the most incredible feat of strength in one of the most badass and cinematic moments in a game filled with badass and cinematic moments by flipping Tyr's temple. We go into the realm between realms, which up until now has served as a fast travel load screen and then fling ourselves off the edge. Turns out Tyr threw a tower down there and we go through it to restore it in Midgard. This is it. We're about to get to Jotunheim. This isn't going to work. I've got an eye. One. If you really thought that would work, you're a loser. Mimir only has one eye, so they can't go. Family vacation's off, you guys. Jormungandr reckons he might have swallowed it during a bender one time, so we row into his mouth and search his stomach. It's a weird but fun sequence, and we do actually end up finding the eye. When we have to leave though, something starts attacking our big snake boy and he spits us out just in time to meet with Freya, who wants to find Baldur. She's in luck, because it was Baldur that was attacking Jormungandr, obviously. He's pissed at Freya's presence and he wants to kill her. Kratos tries talking him down, but that doesn't work. They fight, with Freya stepping in to try and stop Kratos from killing her son, even though this would mean her death. During the fight, Mimir remembers that mistletoe is Baldur's weakness, and with this, he can be killed. Having used it on him, we beat him to a pulp, until finally, our hands around his neck, Atreus echoes his father's words back to him, saying that Baldur is beaten and he isn't a threat. Freya begs us to stop, and we do, telling Baldur to stay away from her. He doesn't. He can't forgive her for what she's done, and she submits to Baldur killing her, but Kratos steps in and snaps his neck instead. Freya, despairing at the death of her son, vows to rain down every agony imaginable upon Kratos, and then we leave. The story ends with Kratos and Atreus making it to Jotunheim to scatter Fae's ashes, but not before finding out that she was a giant and Atreus is actually Loki and has a significant part to play in Ragnarok. We also see a prophecy foretelling Kratos' death. 
but that's a problem for another time. Okay, well, technically the story ends with Thor showing up at their house, but the Fae thing is a much nicer way to end the summary, so thanks for making me bring that up. Now my flow is ruined. Now I've left a lot out and only really scratched the surface of the events as they happened, but the important thing to note here is that this is a highly character-driven journey that is ultimately exploring the father-son relationship between our two protagonists. Kratos is a noticeably different man at the end of the game, and Atreus is a lot wiser too. There are so many huge set pieces and cinematic moments, but it's all there to frame the intimate story of a father teaching his son to be a better god than he was. I won't go into too much depth about Brock and Sindri, or Freya and Balder, but these characters are all so layered and deep and well written that it's hard not to get attached to them, especially when you have a relatively small cast that you see often in your travels. In addition to having well-written characters and plot beats, I reckon it does a remarkably good job of justifying its mechanics in a story sense. Obviously, there's a lot of back and forth between locations and characters, like in every game, but it never feels contrived or forced. When you're seconds away from completing your goal and it gets yanked away from you, I never felt cheated or demotivated. I always just felt galvanized into further action, because I couldn't wait to see what happened next. The story is paced really well too. For newcomers to the series, like myself, we get plenty of introduction to the characters and all the necessary context for past actions is doled out in appropriate measure throughout the game. There's breathing room when characters need their moments, like Kratos going back to get the Blades of Chaos, and there's a rising energy towards the end that really feels like the culmination of all of your hard work. I love this story, and while my enthusiasm for it might be slightly biased by my love for its setting, which I'll talk more about later, I think it's a popular opinion. I appreciate its character focus, the themes it's based around resonate with me, and I enjoy seeing Kratos become a better father, creating his legacy, urging Atreus to be better. I also really love the one-shot technique of storytelling. It makes everything flow so well, and really makes your actions seem like part of the story itself. So, now I've summarised the story of God of War and my own thoughts of it, it's time to move on to Red Dead. Fair warning, this game is like twice as long, so I'll try to keep it as brief as possible, but there's just a lot of story to cover here. Red Dead 2's story is divided into chapters, and we open in Chapter 1 with the Vanderlind gang trying to find shelter in a snowstorm. We soon figure out that they've fled from a bank robbery in Blackwater gone wrong, and not to jump the gun, but this is a common thread. They take shelter in an old mining town, and we learn from Dutch, the gang leader, that not only are some of our members missing or injured, but some are dead too. Dutch takes Arthur out to look for food and survivors, and it's here we're introduced to some of the game's mechanics and a bit of backstory. We learn about the gang's dire situation, we see the bleak conditions of the world we're in, we get an insight into Dutch as a character, and we meet up with Micah, the biggest c*** in the known universe. Unlike God of War, you're able to choose dialogue options in Red Dead 2, which we get a taste of in this tutorial. We stumble on a homestead where a rival gang, the O'Driscolls, are already hanging out. Naturally, we kill them and loot everything. In the process, we find Sadie Adler, whose husband was killed by the O'Driscolls. We take her in, but not before Micah sets fire to her house and everything she owns, that we haven't already stolen. Story-wise, this is a great intro. It shows us some important players, it gives us our rivals right away, it introduces a really important character in a meaningful way, and it shows the existing tension between Arthur, Dutch, and Micah that only builds throughout the narrative. It's also cinematic as fuck. The next day, Hosea sends us out with Javier to look for John on Abigail's request. I'm sorry, there's going to be almost as many names as a Tyrion chapter in Clash of Kings. We get more tutorial, because this game has more mechanics than a Grand Prix, and we find John chilling on a mountain and freezing. <laughs> like a dumbass, am I right? We save him, Arthur writes in his journal, then there's yet another tutorial with Charles. Micah sucks more ass, we go to clear out an O'Driscoll camp, even though this seems to go against Dutch's code, then we take over the O'Driscoll's plans to rob a train. It goes as well as you'd expect. We get some money for the gang and piss off Leviticus Cornwall, who owned the train. Then we all ferry ourselves out to Horseshoe Overlook to set up camp properly. This is where Chapter 1 ends, having set up the characters in the gang, our rivals, and our ultimate goal of getting enough money to fuck off somewhere peaceful. 
Chapter 2 starts with Arthur checking out the nearby town of Valentine. We get a little taste of the morality system, furthering our investment in Arthur as a character, and basically just try to make the gang some cash. Well, this seems like a nice place to hunt, kill, collect debts, get coughed on, sure that won't come up again later. We also sadly have to crack this dickhead out of prison, and he can't not be insufferable for even a few minutes. We learn the Pinkertons are on our trail. You may know them as enforcers for Wizards of the Coast, but otherwise we're happy. Oh, I'm sorry, what's that? We fucked it up? Like, immediately? Yeah, so we killed everyone in Valentine, which surely means we can just have the town now, but whatever, that's where chapter two ends. In chapter three, we move on to a new camp near the town of Rhodes, where we stumble into a Romeo and Juliet story between two rival families, the Greys and the Braithwaites. But first, fishing time. Here we bond some more with Dutch and Hosea. We see how tight-knit the group really is, as well as how optimistic Dutch feels at this point in the story. Oh, you poor fool. We get to working for the lawmen in Rhodes, and make some money through other ventures too. We ferry love letters between Beau Gray Beau and- Gray, yep. son of Tavish Gray, okay, uh, nephew yep, of Lee between... Gray, the sheriff, grandson of old Jesus Murdo Christ. Gray. Between Beau Gray and Penelope Braithwaite, drive a carriage for these absolute chads, rob a wagon really cleanly, just, just so cleanly, and hand out some moonshine for a promotional stunt. We have a big chat with Dutch and Micah, where Micah suggests robbing them both, and Dutch says we can play them against each other. This involves setting fire to the Greys' tobacco plantation for the Braithwaites, and stealing Braithwaite thoroughbreds for the Greys. Before that can play out though, we get kidnapped by the O'Driscolls and stripped down to our Finn the Human cosplay. We just barely get out alive and make our way back to camp, forcing Dutch to confront the consequences of his behaviour. This does nothing. We see visions of a deer in golden sunlight, then we flash forward a few weeks. Now we get to enact our devious plans of capitalising on the two warring families and we- Sorry, what's that? W we fucked it up again? Like, badly? We have a shootout in Rhodes with Micah, Bill and Sean, who dies. We basically massacre the entire town, including Sheriff Grey, so there's that bridge burnt. When we get back to camp, John's son Jack has gone missing, and we figure out that the Braithwaites took him. We roll on up in the coolest sequence in the game, and burn down the Braithwaite Manor after finding out that some bloke called Angelo Bronte has Jack in Saint Denis. The Pinkertons roll up on us again like we just found a second copy of the One Ring Magic card, so we find a new home in Shady Bell, and that's the end of Chapter 3. Saint Denis is a little bit bigger than the previous towns, and this Angelo Bronte guy is actually a crime lord. Luckily, we get Jack back unharmed, but this does give a glimpse into John's relationship with Abigail, Jack's mother, as well as furthering the bond between John and Arthur. We have a most welcome moment of levity in the fireside party, then it's back to business with a letter from Mary, Arthur's old love. She needs help with her douchebag father, and while the two reconnect a little over the course of these missions, they ultimately part ways, with Arthur saying he wants to leave this gang lifestyle behind and run away with her. We then go to a party that Angelo Bronte is thrown, where we learn that not only is he a raging dickhole, but apparently there's a lot of money to be found at the trolley station if you catch my drift. So naturally, we rob a riverboat casino. I guess we'll get to the trolley station later. This boat heist goes really smoothly. Like, just so smoothly. We grab some more cash, then we help Reigns fall in his tribe with some trouble they've been having with the US Army. We've all been there, mate. When we get back to Shady Bell, the O'Driscolls attack, pushing us to leave again. This makes Dutch a little money crazy, and we head straight to the trolley station without a plan, just Dutch telling us to think big. In another shocking twist, there's nothing there, and the police are onto us immediately. Again, we massacre everyone and barely make it out alive. Dutch decides to take on Bronte, then hit the Saint Denis bank. Hosea is very against this plan, but we do it anyway, which once again seems to be for revenge, something Dutch claims not to be a fan of. We murder our way to Bronte, who is unarmed and surrenders. We take him to Dutch, who executes him by drowning him in the river. This whole scene is really well acted and shot, and it cements Dutch's gradual slide into utter lunacy. It also shows us just how disturbed Arthur and John are at this behaviour. We hit the bank, and we fuck that up too. The Pinkertons show up. 
Hosea gets killed, Lenny gets killed, and the rest of us escape on a boat headed for Cuba. If you think we actually make it to Cuba, you haven't been paying attention. A storm comes, we sink, and then we get thrown into the worst part of the game. Chapter 5, Guama. We walk a lot, then get immediately captured, so we walk some more, but slower this time. Some rebel fighters free us, we kill a lot of the big boss's men, then Arthur gets captured again. We kill even more men in creative ways, Dutch grows even more unhinged, we save the rest of our gang, and we escape back home. So that's a very simplified version, and while I did say it was the worst part of the game, it serves a very important purpose in a narrative sense, splitting the two sides of the story, inciting the fracture of the gang. Dutch is on the warpath, and we can see that Arthur is losing faith while Micah is feeding the beast. Hey, why is Arthur coughing so much? We go back to Shady Bell, but the gang has moved on to La Kay. We show up, but like less than an hour later, the Pinkertons show up too, and they are not here to fuck spiders. There's a huge shootout, and we're forced to relocate again. Abigail wants to get John out of jail, but Dutch doesn't really give a shit, so Sadie and Arthur will have to take care of it themselves. He meets up with Sadie to- God damn it, dude, why are you coughing so much? Oh, we have tuberculosis. Arthur takes a while to contemplate this death sentence of a diagnosis. To put his life and actions into perspective, then he meets up with Sadie to plan John's rescue. This includes shooting people from a hot air balloon, which is amazing. We find another place to stay, and then it's time to rescue John for real. But first, everyone's going crazy around here. Chapter 6 kicks off with a more subdued feeling at camp. We rescue John, which goes super well. Then Dutch gets mad at us because he's a dick, deepening his growing mistrust of Arthur while furthering his bond with Micah, convinced there's a mole amongst them. <laughs> Dutch kills Cornwall, then repeats his catchphrase. I have a plan. We try to help Reigns Fall and his people in their fight with the government, but Dutch has other plans. He uses Reigns Fall's impulsive son, Eagle Flies, convincing him to attack a government compound, but we'll get back to that. First, Dutch wants to blow up a bridge to create some confusion and keep the military off their backs. That'll work. There's a break in this heightened pace here where we talk to Rain's Fall, walk with him and pick herbs, and Arthur tells both the chief and the audience about his deceased son, Isaac. It's here we can really see Arthur's outlook on life changing as he talks about Dutch and the gang. He wants to do something good with the time he has remaining to him. After that, it's straight back to the action. We tell John that the time is coming to leave Dutch, and then we finally see Colmo Driscoll hang, which goes super well. Eagle Flies is now attacking the military, and gets captured because of Dutch's terrible plan. We go with Charles to rescue him, finally reveal our TB diagnosis, and then it's time for Eagle Flies and some of his tribe to attack an oil plant. Rain's Fall begs him not to, but he does it anyway. Arthur wants to save him because the odds are ridiculous and the plan was terrible, and Dutch goes to distract the military. Dutch and Arthur go to find Bonds in the office, then Dutch shows his true colours and leaves us to die. Eagle Flies saves us but gets himself shot for the trouble, and he dies after we take him to his father. Arthur's condition is getting worse, but we head back to the dwindling gang for one last job. We hit an army train, but John gets shot in the process. Afterwards, Dutch tells us John died, tells us to keep moving. Meanwhile, the Pinkertons got Abigail at our new camp, and Micah convinces Dutch to abandon her. We don't let that stand, and we head out with Sadie to save Abigail. We finally kill the head of the Pinkertons and find out that Micah was the mole all along, just in case anyone needed yet another reason to hate that unwashed foreskin of a man. We send Abigail and Sadie on their way, and go back to confront Dutch and Micah with the truth. Then John shows up out of nowhere and goes off on Dutch. Unfortunately, the Pinkertons interrupt our calm, reasonable chat, and we flee into the caves with John. There are a few possible endings for this chapter, but ultimately John escapes, and we come face to face with Micah for our final stand. Dutch leaves with Micah, and we take our last breath as the sun rises on the horizon. The epilogue sees us playing as John Marston a few years later. We take Abigail and Jack to a ranch to live a peaceful life, but a scuffle with bounty hunters sees both of them leave. John buys a plot of land, and with the help of Uncle and Charles, they build a ranch. Abigail and Jack return, and they all live happily ever after, until Sadie shows up and says she knows where Micah is. 
For one last time, before Red Dead 1 of course, they ride out to confront Micah. Dutch is there, and John rips into him again about all of his failings, all of the terrible things that happened because of him and Micah. He shoots Micah, leaves the money, and runs away. And that's where the story ends. John having closed this final chaotic chapter of his own life to begin anew with his now wife and child. My god, that's a lot of story to summarise, and I only gave you the cliff notes. If I'd gone into more detail for both games, that would have been the whole video. So let's talk about Red Dead's story before I start comparing them. It's a huge, sprawling narrative, we know that. But again, it's centred around a close-knit group of deep, complicated and well-developed characters. In a way, Arthur Morgan is who you make him, and it's always exciting to write your own story in a game. But he's also a man full of integrity, who gets taken advantage of time and time again. It's impossible to go through the whole game and not feel a meaningful connection to Arthur, not feel the heartbreak he does, the weight of the decisions he has to make. The way the gang dynamics change around you as you play is fascinating to behold. Moving from struggling to survive, to doing one last job over and over, to just trying to get everyone out to safety by the end, the writers wring every last emotion out of you over the immense runtime, and there's something here to satisfy everyone, especially when Dutch kills Micah. There are so many interactions you can have with so many characters, many of whom I didn't even mention because it's already taken me so long just to skim the story, and they all feel so alive and real. There's a sense of gravitas and dread that really falls on you in the second half of the game, when the tragedies begin to strike one after another, when Dutch's plans and convictions fall to pieces, and when the gang starts to crack. It's a slower pace, but the payoffs make the build-ups work, and there's a lot of variance to be found in the narrative. Overall, I think it's a master-crafted story that allows player choice to be woven in without coming at the expense of the plot beats they were trying to fulfil. And it's a small thing, but I love the way they incorporate the journal entries throughout that you can check and read in-game. There's a good reason why it's considered one of the greatest storylines in all of gaming. Every gang member, every job, every new location, they're all so memorable, and they fit together in a way that could only be accomplished by an absurdly talented team with a lot of time and care. These two stories aren't easy to compare, but I guess that's the point of the video, so I kind of have to. So one of the most obvious differences is the length. God of War is long at around 20 hours of main story, but Red Dead 2 is insane. It's over twice as long at 50 hours. Sure, these are averages, but by every metric possible, Red Dead's story is immense. As a result, it's paced a lot slower than God of War's, which means that while it does get off to a slower start and there are slower sections throughout, you do get more time with the characters to explore their nuances and relationships. Thank God for that too, because there are just so many characters and locations and story threads to keep track of. On the flip side, God of War's story is jam-packed with twists, turns and high-energy set pieces that give it a more action-oriented feel. Preferences between these two styles is subjective and can often come down to how much time you have to play the game. If I only have half an hour, I'll probably jump into God of War, because it doesn't feel like you can get enough done in Red Dead in that time. Their styles of storytelling are also quite different. Red Dead 2 is a sprawling open world, ready to freely roam pretty much the second you're out of the gate. God of War is much more linear, with some areas opening up more after you've discovered them or finished some quest lines. I like the way that you can mould Arthur into your own version of a Wild West outlaw, and I like that you have a choice in how to solve certain problems and resolve certain issues. There's not really a sense of choice in God of War, but the team did an incredible job of telling such an emotional and somehow simultaneously grand and personal story in a linear way. While you can't choose what type of father or god Kratos will be, you do have the option to stay a while longer in certain areas, to pursue side content before jumping into more main story, and that's a nice touch. Obviously, RDR2 wins hands down in the freedom category, but there's something to be said for the much tighter experience of God of War, because there isn't a single section in that game that makes me feel the way Guama does. As I said, this section especially is going to be very subjective, and will often come down to what resonated with each player specifically. 
I prefer the fantasy setting of God of War to the more realistic western setting of Red Dead, but I do think that Arthur's story is more compelling, more emotional, and clearly more popular. So from a story standpoint, while I enjoy God of Wars a little bit more, I think Red Dead wins despite its uneven pacing. It helps that Red Dead 2 is, despite being a prequel, fully contained, giving us the full story of Arthur Morgan from start to finish. God of War has a self-contained story as well, but it suffers a little from having to set things up for Ragnarok, and while the Thor tease at the end is cool, it robs it a bit of its emotional weight. So there's one point for Red Dead, yeah! but only just. I can't state enough that both of these games have some of the best narratives in the entire medium. I also feel that I should mention here that the voice and motion capture performances for both games are incredible and deepen the immersion and investment in each story. Now it's time to talk about the next most obvious point of comparison, and this one is going to be a lot less neck and neck. So if you've played both of these games then you'll probably be prepared for what I'm about to say. Aiming, shooting, looting, and moving on foot in Red Dead 2 feels like absolute ass. There's no getting around it. Arthur Morgan handles worse than the Titan submersible. He's slow, he's unwieldy, and it's hard to make him look at something that isn't on the other end of a gun. Third person games like this always have problems with small target interactables. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Geralt. But sometimes you have to make Arthur do a three point turn just to get a prompt for an object a foot away. This issue is compounded by just how easy it is to accidentally shoot people in the face. There are few other games I have ever played where it is so insanely easy to execute people on the spot. I will admit, given that I have a firm grasp on my lefts and rights, I don't struggle with this quite as much as my girlfriend does, but every now and then you'll be trying to interact with a shopkeeper, you'll see a prompt come up in the corner of the screen, and you'll hit the corresponding button, which ganks them like you've just used console commands. Again, once once you learn the controls properly, this is unlikely to happen often, but god damn, it says draw weapon, not open hole in face. It's a fascinating contrast, because while it's so easy to kill innocent bystanders and shopkeepers, the terrible gunplay and movement makes it quite difficult to kill things you actually want to kill. Now, I play on PlayStation, so the auto lock is pretty extreme, which obviously helps when you're trying to aim at some bloke sticking his head up above a rock, but that doesn't make the gunplay any less janky. It's slow to aim, even the lightest of guns feel sluggish and imprecise, and the lock-on actually works against you when you're hunting. You want to go for precise head or neck shots, but if you're used to relying on the lock-on, then you'll botch the pelt. The variance in combat is mostly limited to different weapon types, and while using a bow does feel marginally different to using a repeater rifle, it doesn't change the core loop of combat. There are some sections that require stealth, and have you using knives or your bare hands, these sections are welcome, but few and far between, and aren't particularly deep. For 90% of the game, combat boils down to point and shoot, and occasionally use Deadeye to take out a bunch of guys at once. Okay, look, I've made it sound terrible, but while it does have its many faults, it does still feel suitably visceral, and really conveys that Old West sense of brutality that the setting is built on. There's also variance between fighting human enemies and hunting. Hunting introduces tracking, uses the stealth system, and requires far more precision than regular combat. It's a nice change, but even then there's not a lot of variance between the different animals that you track and hunt. I mentioned that Arthur himself is slow and imprecise too, but even that gets thrown out the window at camp. His speed absolutely tanks, and I get it, it's meant to be a calm place, so it's nice that you can't accidentally shoot any of your companions with one misclick, but being able to move at slightly more than a snail's pace would be great. Also, to make him run, you have to spam the run button, not just hold it down. I know that's a small complaint, but I hate it. I hate it a lot. Mounted movement is miles better. It's night and day. Horses corner well, they feel fast, they're easy to maneuver, and you can unlock specific moves and controls for them by furthering your bond. It's lucky you spend so much of the game on horseback because it feels like a dream to ride through the plains and canyons of America on a fully bonded horse. A substantial portion of gameplay consists of riding between locations, either alone with your thoughts and the soundtrack, 
or chatting with your mates. This might be a negative to some, but I found it to be a welcome respite to the chaos of shootouts, and I always love this kind of lore and backstory delivery in games. Unfortunately, mounted combat suffers from all the same issues that regular combat does, but now if you move too much, the camera will swivel and spin to compensate, making shooting from horseback an often confusing and frustrating affair. Here the lock-on system really pulls its weight, because I can't imagine having to manually aim with a controller while galloping down a hill. What about after you've killed your enemies? Looting the bodies means going to each one in turn, pressing a button to loot them, watching Arthur bend down and rifle through their clothing, then standing back up again. It's slow. It's immersive, but it's slow. Looting containers and drawers and cupboards in houses is no better. You have to press a button to open the drawer or cupboard in question, then press again for each individual item you're taking inside. Again, it's realistic and immersive watching him consider and handle each object, but god damn it gets old. I think that a better balance could have been struck between immersion and tedium here. There has to at least have been a better way to speed up the process when you're not in combat, because at the moment looting feels like a chore. Speaking of chores, you can do some around camp to earn honour and restore health, stamina and deadeye. They mostly consist of carrying something from one place to another, or pressing a button to chop wood. They're not particularly rewarding, but they do accurately simulate doing chores, so I guess they fulfil their purpose. Overall, a lot of the gameplay decisions were made to increase the sense of realism and immersion. I get that. I even appreciate it sometimes, but that doesn't make it any less boring to watch Arthur slowly open and inspect his hundredth cupboard, or any less frustrating to struggle against the janky cover system. The gameplay suits the slower pace of the story, and for many people this won't be an issue. There are plenty of people who treat this more as an interactive experience than a third person shooter. It definitely wasn't a deal breaker for me, but I can absolutely see how it could be. Let's move on. God of War's gameplay is not perfect, but it is miles better than Red Dead's. Ah, shit, I gave away the game pretty quickly in this section, but I guess I'll spend the next little while justifying that statement. It's much faster paced, which again doesn't automatically make it better, but in a vacuum it does make it more exciting. There's less time between interacting with puzzles or loot or combat, and I think all of those are handled better than Red did. Let's start with the big one. Combat in God of War is a little bit polarizing. There are only two weapons to choose from, and there is a serious lack of enemy variety. You will be killing a lot of Draugr and reskinned trolls. Ah, <laughs> that's what I was foreshadowing. In the early game, combat feels repetitive and like you're spamming the attack button until the health bar drops to zero and you only have access to the one weapon, but I personally feel like many of these issues are resolved quite quickly as you progress through the game. I mean, the lack of enemy variety doesn't get fixed, you only see more and more of these bastards, but the other problems do. Not only do the Blades of Chaos add a whole new field to combat, but you get access to a bunch of different abilities and powers you can use to augment your arsenal. There's a whole slew of different techniques and abilities for each weapon, as well as light and heavy runic attacks and Spartan Rage. Atreus adds a layer to combat as well, with two types of arrows that affect enemies in different ways and powerful runic summons. True, it takes a while to unlock enough to give this sense of variety, but in the later game, if you're playing at a higher difficulty, you'll need to use everything at your disposal to take out some enemies and bosses anyway, forcing you to consider these different powers and techniques. Regardless of what you think about the combat variety, there is no denying that using the weapons is satisfying as fuck. Throwing the Leviathan Axe, hearing that thud, and watching it zip back to your hand is some of the coolest shit I've ever seen and done in gaming. Using the Blades of Chaos to set fire to all those dumbass Draugr and then pulling one towards you to slam it to pieces feels like justice for having to fight these fuckers so often. Combat is fluid, smooth, often deliberate, and just fun. While the enemy variety overall is lackluster, the encounter variety is pretty damn good. And as I said before, it keeps you on your toes. Plus, when you fill up the stun bar, you get access to what is essentially a finishing move, with a unique animation for each enemy type. It's some good visceral fun to watch Kratos go ham on one particularly annoying enemy, either using their own weapons against them, or literally ripping them apart with his bare hands. Between combat, you'll be traversing the Nine Realms, opening chests, solving puzzles, and taking down Odin's CCTV. Kratos moves pretty fast and pretty smooth. 
unless the particular section of the game forces you to walk, and more importantly, he's precise. You might have some camera issues in small spaces, but you never feel like you're struggling to look at the right object or to fine tune and maneuver Kratos into a certain position like you're doing a reverse park on your driving test. This is mostly due to how the game's looting system is designed, where instead of picking things off of shelves and out of cupboards individually, loot comes in the form of coloured orbs dropped on the ground or automatically taken from opening chests. Watching the chest animation over and over can get tiresome, but it's not too long and it's a damn sight better than watching Arthur become an octogenarian every time he needs to handle a can of beans. You'll spend a lot of time in boats, rowing across the Lake of the Nine or up its adjacent rivers. The boats are easy to control and aren't so slow as to be annoying, nor are they so fast as to cut off Mimir's excellent stories. More on that later. That's pretty much it for movement. You're either walking slash running or you're rowing and chilling. That is, when you're controlling Kratos. The game interrupts you with cutscenes a lot. If you've invested in the story, this isn't such a big problem because you're watching something unfold. However, there are also many stretches of the game where you're confined in a certain space and movement is either prohibitively restricted or pointless because you're waiting for an objective anyway. Again, like in Red Dead, it's immersive to watch our main characters descend the entire way on this lift, and I get that the whole one-shot thing prohibits a cut to black, but it's definitely not the only time it happens, and the game's lucky we have banter and stories to see it through. It's not immersive to wander the realm between realms waiting for a door to appear, but I understand that they had to hide the loading screen somewhere. Like I said, God of War's gameplay is leagues ahead of Red Dead's. If you've played both games and you prefer Red Dead, which isn't uncommon, I'm happy to assume you're not there for the gameplay alone. The pace of the gameplay matches the pace of the story, and that's fine, but god damn it gets frustrating. Kratos controls like a dream compared to Arthur. I've seen some crazy videos online of people animation cancelling and using techniques I can barely understand, let alone execute, because God of War's combat system has a lot of nuance to master. I'm not saying it's the best, but I really enjoyed it, and I found it a suitable mix of satisfying, visually impressive, and challenging. Also, as much as people complain about the lack of enemy variety in God of War, there's basically none in Red Dead. You get to kill either a man with a gun, a man with a different kind of gun, or a man with a gun on a horse. That's your variety. I hope I've justified why I gave the point to God of War on this one, but I'm equally sure I really didn't have to. I also think this is a big point, easily one of the most important on the list. This might be several people's number one concern, and if it's not, if story is your biggest factor, then this is number two. And I think that this is where the biggest disparity is. The stories of both games are really good and might even come down to preference. But I think you'd struggle to justify saying Red Dead's gameplay is really good, or as good as God of War's, or even close to as good. You've seen the title, you know what I'm arguing, and this is a major factor. But now it's time to ignore Siri and play Gwent, or whatever the equivalents are for these two games. Red Dead has a huge open world that you can explore once you start Chapter 2. You can broadly go anywhere you want and take on whatever manner of activity you desire, so long as you've done the appropriate tutorial and you don't mind roleplaying a hundred or so years further forward to get instantly shot by police for going into certain areas. This game is huge. Almost everywhere you go, you'll find someone nearby who needs help, or has something to tell you, or is just up to no good. These are marked by little dots on your minimap when you get close to them, and while they're usually short experiences out on the road, they're always a welcome change to solitary riding. They're well crafted too. Don't think these are just cookie cutter recyclings of the same three muggings, beggars, and dying travellers over and over. There are plenty of these random encounters to go around, and while they can repeat with other NPCs to keep the game world feeling alive, you'll never feel like you've done them too many times. You can almost always find something to do while you're out riding if you want to. There's animals in each area you can hunt for their meat and pelts and fat. There are streams and lakes you can fish in. There are even trains and carriages to rob if you're feeling particularly villainous. The fact that you can simply go out and choose to rob people in so many different ways is a testament to the attention to detail that went into so many aspects of this game. There are stranger side missions marked with a question mark on the minimap, and these are more traditional style side quests. 
This being Red Dead 2, they're all more interesting, larger in scale, and more varied than your typical side quest in another game, but the structure is the same. There's 31 of these, and while they're all optional, they're all great. There's serial killers, there's a time traveller, there's a murderous robot, and it's some of the most bizarre and unique questing in all of gaming. These strange missions alone can give you hours of entertainment, because just like the main story, they're incredibly well written, with a whole new host of fully realised characters. Plus, quite a few of them change outcomes and events based on your choices, so you have a lot of agency here. I mentioned before that you can hunt and fish, but there's more to it than just a throwaway sentence. There are hundreds of animals to hunt, and while the gameplay loop is largely the same for each variety, you will have to consider different weapons, equipment, and ammunition when pursuing certain types or sizes of prey. There are legendary animals which are more difficult to hunt and kill, but offer unique rewards. As for fishing, again, there's different types and sizes of fish, requiring different locations and baits, as well as legendary fish to catch. There's so much content even in just these two activities, and while they get a little repetitive, they do offer interesting rewards and incentives. But wait, there's more! You can trap and train various horses, including the elite white Arabian horse, one of the best in the game. This involves approaching very slowly, calming the horse, then playing a minigame to keep it from bucking you off. If only you could just cast Axie. Back at camp, in addition to doing tediously immersive chores, you can also play poker, blackjack, dominoes, and Gwent with your fellow gang members. Sorry, uh, that last one might be wrong. It's actually Five Finger Fillet, which is almost as exciting and tense as Gwent. You might not sink a lot of time into these, but it's fun to make the others mad every now and then by taking their money with a good hand, and it's impressive that Rockstar managed to include it all. There are bounties to pursue, treasure maps to follow, and even fashion and hairstyle choices that would rival the Bratz games. Okay, so this is almost overwhelming. There's just so much to do in Red Dead 2. The only other games you see this amount of side content in are Ubisoft games, but the side content here is actually good. It might not all be your cup of tea, but I can guarantee there's something that will hook you away from the main story eventually. You can spend hundreds of hours exploring the map, seeing locations the story never took you to, interacting with new characters and doing side missions, and you can still find more to do. It's a testament to the world building and the quest design that barely any of these side activities activities feel cookie cutter or repetitious. The main story might be the reason why people rate this game so highly, but the side content is why they keep playing it. What about God of War? Well, as I said, it's not exactly open world and it's not as open-ended as RDR2 either, so it's safe to say that it has strictly less side content. That's not surprising, basically every other game ever made has less side content than Red Dead 2 but it's about the quality of the content, not the amount, right? Well, let's look at what God of War has to offer. As usual, there are your traditional side quests. You talk to a quest giver, they tell you where and how and why to fuck around, and then you run off to do said fucking around. These take you all across Midgard and beyond, and you find yourself freeing a chained dragon, toppling a statue of Thor, and uncovering an even more strained father-son relationship than the central one of the story. These generally do a good job of providing more than just go here and kill that, with some compelling lore and character storylines to drive you along, but you'll start to see some repetition creep in, and our pesky friend the lack of enemy variety is back. I really enjoyed the side quests, and the rewards you get make most of them feel worthwhile, but some of them end up taking a little too long for very little in return. On top of side quests, there's an arena in Muspelheim where you battle your way through various combat challenges for unique rewards, leading you all the way to a Valkyrie fight at the end. More on that later. To even get to this realm, you have to find four pieces of a cipher, which is a nice touch that adds a level of mystery and anticipation. The combat challenges are actually challenging, many of them forcing you to try different strategies before you can make it through them. The area is visually interesting and distinct, you end up fighting a good variety of enemies because the challenges throw pretty much everything at you, but I think it wears a little thin by the end. Plus, if you've already noticed the repeated enemy types and designs, this won't do much to alleviate that. Niflheim serves as another completely optional realm where you find a foggy maze centred around Ivaldi's workshop. 
You can journey and fight and puzzle through the roguelite style maze, collecting mist echoes until your vape cloud tolerance runs out, then come back to the workshop and cash them in. Here you're basically grinding for late game gear, and while the loot, like crafting resources and axe pommels can be cool, there's not a lot of variety to be found in this area outside the Valkyrie deep in the maze. The Lake of the Nine is the game's largest area, and there's lots to explore. There are dozens of islands, coves, and hidden trails to find loot and enemies. There are realm tears to close, which means a tough fight for each one, and a reward of loot. There are treasure maps to follow, also, of course, leading to loot. There are little collectibles to be found around the map that only really matter for getting a platinum trophy. There are lore markers that give a little insight into the world building, represented as journal entries by Atreus. And as I touched on before, there are spectral ravens to find and kill. Again, only really necessary if you're going for 100%. There are also hidden chambers of Odin, sealed behind these icy doors you can only open once you've got a piece of the chisel. Many of them contain loot, which by this point is probably less exciting than it could be, but some of them contain Valkyries, so it's time to talk about them. The Valkyries are the best side content in the game, and though they share similar visual and combat designs, they are the most challenging bosses God of War has to offer, and they are damn fun to fight. Each of the nine Valkyries has their own unique moveset, except Sigrun, the Valkyrie Queen who basically just combines them all. They have a huge health pool and deal massive damage, so you have to learn their combos and techniques. You can't just run in and bash them with your axe. Completing these fights is hugely rewarding, not just because you get some great loot and experience, but it feels like killing a boss in a Souls game. It's satisfying like few other bosses in this game are. Once you've defeated the first eight, you can place their helmets in the Council of the Valkyries to face Sigrun, easily the most challenging fight of the game. And largely, that's it for side content in God of War. There's enough here to keep you invested in each region, some unique offerings in Muspelheim and Niflheim, and a lot of exploration in the Lake of the Nine, but there's a big difference between the side content here and the side content in Red Dead 2, on top of the variance in sheer amount. Every piece of side content in Red Dead 2 serves and furthers the world building in an impressively immersive way. You're not just hunting an animal to complete a quest or to get some experience. You're doing it to feed the gang or to provide the camp with pelts. You're not just playing poker to take a menial amount of money off your friends. You're bonding with characters who react to every raise, check and fold. You're playing into the story. Things happen in the world without you ever interacting with them, and you can tell this is the case when you finally do. God of War's side content is interesting and engaging, but it never attains this level of immersion or world integration. Kratos is the actioner of all deeds in God of War, and much of the side content revolves around him collecting items to make himself stronger to collect more items and so on and so forth. Arthur is a small fish in a great ocean, and he feels like an important participant in the story rather than the center of all stories around him. Both of these approaches are fine and probably work better for their respective games, stories, and settings, but the Red Dead approach is far more interesting. I don't think it'll come as a surprise when I give the point to Red Dead in this category. As I said, I enjoyed the side content in both games. I even platinumed God of War because I enjoyed it so much. But Red Dead 2 eclipses just about every other game in this regard. Let's move on to our next point of comparison, and this one might get me some disagreements. Both of these games are beautiful. It's hard to compare them in general, but for graphics it's just hard to choose a winner. Let's look at God of War first. Set in a series of visually distinct, fantastical Scandinavian realms, the landscapes in God of War steal the show. They're huge and epic in every sense of the word, giving a great sense of scale. It's nearly photorealistic, and every part of the setting drips with grandeur and fantasy. Standing atop the mountain in Midgard is breathtaking, and you'll be impressed by the design, style, and general vibe of every new realm you journey to throughout the game. Midgard, where you'll probably spend most of your time, has a lot to see. There's snowy vistas, hidden waterfalls, Freya's vibrantly coloured grove and turtle house, all the staples. There's also Thamer's Corpse, which is one of the coolest and most unique regions in any game I've ever played. 
Alfheim is ethereal and otherworldly. Muspelheim looks like the fiery pits of hell, and Helheim looks bleak and desolate, but also strangely beautiful. The art direction in this game is so strong that it makes up for any minor lack of clarity in models or textures, if there is any in the first place. The size of the realm towers and other structures in the Nine Realms dwarf Kratos and Atreus, adding to the mythical feel, giving some actions more weight, like when we flip Tyr's temple, or when we scatter Thor's statue into the lake. Not to mention when we sail inside Jormungandr, who's so big you can't see his entire body at any point in the game. The facial animations, and really just the entirety of the mocap performances in general, look incredible. You can see so much emotion in every character, and it feels like nothing has been lost from the actors when their work was transferred into the game. The weapons have immaculate detail in their changing etchings and inlays, and every new set of armor is novel, distinct, and reflective of its properties, which is not only fun to try them out and see what they look like, but gives crafting and looting an extra little layer of satisfaction. I mentioned it before, but the game is cinematic as hell. There are so many big set piece moments that took my breath away, like the fight with the dragon, or even just the first fight with Baldur. This is made more impressive by the game's one shot technique. Everything flows like the finest nectar of the gods, and it gives a layer of immersion and investment into the story that no other video game cinematography ever has before. Kratos moves through this titanic world with ease, and you can see and feel every nuance of his character because of this one-shot style. Now, I feel like I'm gonna sound like a bit of a broken record here, but Red Dead 2 almost looks better than real life. The skies, landscapes, rocks, trees, buildings, everything is rendered to perfection. The lighting is beyond beautiful, with every sunset looking like a painting, and every set of horse testicles always looking just the right size. You could name anything, the foliage, the character models, the water, even the damn animals, all of it is up there with the best the industry has ever seen. It's a staggeringly large map, and every inch that you see plants you more firmly in the wild west, makes you feel like Batman or some other vigilante. From the moment you start the game in that snowstorm, and you venture out to see your horse leaving tracks in the snow, see the lanterns throwing their ruddy glow just far enough to see where you're going, but not far enough to see the world ahead, you can tell exactly what kind of experience this is going to be. The game uses its graphical style and techniques not only to draw you in, but as a companion to its mechanics, pacing, and world building. God of War operates on the same theory, but the executions are wildly different. With God of War, scale and immensity was the name of the game. Here it's about a sense of openness, life, and possibility. You have so much freedom, and there are a plethora of things that you'll see as you're riding that will call to you. It's also in the details, the little things that you don't notice until you do. There's a lot of care put into things that some players might never see. That's impressive. There's animations for nearly everything Arthur does. Your clothes and your horse get dirty and wet in realistic ways, the lighting effects are gorgeous, even on character skin, and the horse balls shrink in the cold, goddammit, what more could you ask for? Again, the facial models and character animations are absolutely incredible, possibly more so than God of War, and every photorealistic cutscene will make you want to scream at Dutch and Micah and their stupid, beautifully rendered faces. It actually feels like you're watching a movie sometimes, because so much care has gone into every location, every shot, every building in every city. You get the idea. There's a fair few unique biomes across the map too, with swamps giving way to grassy plains or open rocky fields. Then there's bustling cities, small towns, snowy mountains. There's no denying it's not as vibrant or varied as God of War, but it's so easy to get lost in the realism of the American West. It's also worth mentioning the cinematic camera mode. Often, while you're riding and talking with other characters, the game will prompt you to turn on cinematic mode. This changes your camera perspective to a series of film-looking shots, allowing you to simply watch the conversation and journey unfold in a more visually interesting fashion. I love this camera mode, and I use it a lot. I think it breaks up the periodic monotony of constant riding, and gives a bunch of angles I would have never seen otherwise. So let's do a bit of comparing. As I said, both games look amazing, and there's certainly few, if any, complaints to be made about either one. From a technical standpoint, I think Red Dead takes it. It's an amazing feat of design, technology, attention to detail, and even to this day, it is a visual marvel. 
I do want to say, however, that while I'm giving the point to Red Dead for its technical prowess, I actually prefer how God of War looks. The sense of wonder and immensity is unmatched in any other game except its sequel, and I personally think that seeing the different realms and areas in God of War was more exciting than in Red Dead. This is another really close category, and some of it comes down to opinion, as I've just stated, but it's not fair to pretend that just because I like the art direction more in God of War, that Red Dead's overall graphical achievements aren't more impressive. There's only one more graphical feature that I want to bring up as a point of comparison for this section. Right now, playing on PlayStation, you can play God of War at 60fps. It's smooth as butter, and it's beautiful for that fast-paced combat. You can't play Red Dead 2 at 60fps on PlayStation. It's locked at 30, even on PS5. This isn't a huge issue, but it would have been a really nice quality of life upgrade to boost that graphical prowess just a bit more. So now that we've talked about how the environments and levels look, let's talk about how they play. There's a lot to see in Red Dead 2, and you'll want to see as much of it as you can. People talk about many open world games feeling simultaneously over cluttered and empty, but Red Dead 2 strikes a great balance of realistic feeling distance and interesting world details to make the rides back and forth feel much more than just errand running. In a bad open world, you can feel like the only player in an empty MMO server, but in a good one like this, there's much more to find either along the way or through exploration than just exclamation marks above NPC heads. The landmarks in this game might not be as huge or visually striking as in God of War, but they do a great job at drawing you in if you've got a few minutes to spare while riding. Rivers and streams will always be great places to find animals and fish, random encounters and characters can be hiding behind any rock or hill, and even the smallest of towns can be linked to a compelling side story you might never have come near on your regular questing. Throughout the course of the story, you won't come anywhere close to seeing all of the map, so it's really on you to go exploring if you want to visit every location. It can take a fair while to travel to some of the far off places, but the horses move quite fast and there's always something to see or do along the way, even if it's just appreciating the landscape. The open world is designed to be as enticing and dynamic as open worlds can possibly be, and they've succeeded. You can spend countless hours wandering, getting distracted, exploring, and questing out between towns and main missions. Unfortunately, this can become a bit of a double-edged sword. With so many things to do and see, some players get overwhelmed by the options and choices. Totally fine. You can just focus on the main story and other things when you stumble across them, but it can get intimidating. The map is so big, and with the fast travel system being activated after you visit a location for the first time, it can introduce a lot of monotony in solitary riding between locations, even if the activities you're undertaking in each place are super fun and unique. This won't bother everyone, and some people probably enjoy that level of role-playing and immersion, but it did eventually bother me when I found such a high proportion of my time was spent riding to a quest marker. The buildings and tighter outdoor locations are fine. They're exactly fine. They're not terrible, but they're not revolutionary. Indoors, you'll find plenty of cover to hide behind for when a fight inevitably breaks out, and plenty of entrances and exits to make your quick escape. I will say, doors and containers and buildings are implemented really well. I like how they look and function, I just don't like how it feels to loot them. None of the buildings feel overly gamified, which is nice because it fits with the world and the rest of the game, but again, it can play against you in larger houses like Braithwaite Manor, which is a nightmare to navigate. It doesn't help that you obviously have to do this on foot, where controlling Arthur and the camera is bearable at best. Even Shady Bell periodically suffers from this issue, and you'll be spending a lot longer there than at Braithwaite Manor. Red Dead 2 manages to accurately simulate the limitations of our physical universe in the way that things usually occur in places. Quest design in open outdoor areas is highly fluid, with an impressive array of objectives, methods, set pieces, and lengths. Some quests will see you chasing people down, some will see you herding sheep, some will just take you on a nice midday stroll. Quest design in enclosed spaces is limited to basic stealth, looting, or shooting. The Drunk Lenny quest is a rare exception, and it's a standout. Big props there. The others, however, are not only interchangeable, 
but because looting and shooting is some of the worst feeling gameplay RDR2 has to offer, you'll forever associate these indoor quest locations with the tedium and frustration of those mechanics. There is a serious disparity between the moment to moment gameplay of being in the open world versus being inside buildings. No matter how interactable and aesthetically pleasing they are, the level design falls flat in indoor environments. God of War's realms are designed like separate series of individual levels, each one with a certain set of physical features, aesthetics, and objectives. If you look at Midgard, the game's largest area, the Lake of the Nine is the most comparable space to Red Dead, albeit much smaller, with space to freely roam and explore, and islands, coves, and passages to link to more self-contained spaces. Then if we zoom in on some of these spaces, we see largely linear levels, and usually the paradigm is solving puzzles or passing real-life perception checks to unlock all the pathways necessary to see the entirety of the level and receive the full rewards. The puzzles aren't overly complex, but they add a nice layer of interaction and in-level exploration that feels rewarding beyond just opening up a new section of the map. Because the game world is smaller than Red Dead and laid out the way that it is, every location feels crafted to perfection for its intended purpose. Some quests see you winding your way along rivers and forest tracks to come to giant ruins, while others rely on impressive verticality to send you climbing upwards to mountain peaks or towering structures. God of War's locations never get boring, unless you spend too much time in Niflheim, and it's always immediately clear where you are. The level designers have also done a really good job at making sure you know where you're going as well, with subtle and not so subtle environmental clues pointing you in the correct direction, or simply with architecture that flows logically from one space to the next. God of War borrows a lot of level design features from Metroidvanias, not in terms of platforming, but in terms of certain pathways through environments being locked until you get the Blades of Chaos, or until you create a shortcut later by progressing the long way around and then kicking a climbable chain down. Atreus' two arrow types play into this puzzle-like design as well, with light arrows needed to create light bridges, and shock arrows needed to explode this red goo stuff to progress sometimes. The shortcuts you're able to create make progression after the main story a lot easier. You don't have to suffer through those long rock climbs and ledge shimmies that were previously filled with character interaction and exposition in silence because that scene's already happened. You can just climb this chain and save some time. That being said, rowing up and down Midgard rarely suffers from the same potential tedium as riding through the American West, because even after the main story is done, Kratos, Atreus, and Mimir will banter as they journey, commenting on the scenery, the task at hand, or telling stories. So often I'll be rowing to a dock, then Mimir will start telling a story, and I'll get so invested that if I've reached my location and Mimir's not done, I'll just sit there listening to what he has to say until he gets to the end, just waiting to get out of the boat because I don't want to miss the tale. That's great writing that lends itself to a great experience navigating the larger spaces. Exploration never feels boring or repetitive, and there are a few reasons for that. First of all, the world is dense. You'll find enemies, loot, and lore around every corner. Secondly, while there may not be as much side content as in Red Dead 2, the locations you perform these activities in are all unique and interesting. Even just visually, there's so much to see in this game. I will admit, there are some locations that are very frustrating to get to, and watching specific climbing animations over and over again is infuriating, but this never tarnished my opinion on the overall level design. I think that exploration in God of War is better than Red Dead 2. There, I said it. There's more to see in Red Dead, more to do, but the locations and loot in God of War absolutely make up for that. The open world design of Red Dead far exceeds most open world games full stop, let alone the open sections of God of War, but for individual locations and tight spaces, God of War is miles ahead. I think I'll have to give the point to God of War here. Every combat encounter, every big story moment, every simple character interaction, the game always knows where to take you and where to lead you next. You never spend so long in any one location to get bored of it 
but you don't move so quickly that you can't get attached. Both of these points could apply to Red Dead as well, but the player-driven exploration experience and the moment-to-moment -moment navigation of specific locations is so much better in God of War that I think it eclipses Red Dead's offering. Both games have travel methods that fit their world building and offer a slight change of pace between quests. I just think it's implemented better in God of War. It feels better, the novelty lasts longer. Both games have combat arenas that reflect the playstyle of combat itself, as well as the player's arsenal but there's precious little ingenuity or variance in Red Dead's, where God of War has gone above and beyond to present interesting locations and terrain for your big battles. Speaking of big battles, no fight is complete without a suitably epic soundtrack or a series of punchy sound effects. I'm not gonna compile every track I loved from each game, both because that would take hours for all of us, and I'm not sure I'm allowed to, but you will have already heard some fantastic excerpts as I've been speaking. Suffice it to say that the soundtracks for both of these games are incredible. Bear McCreary's score gives every single one of Kratos' actions the weight and gravitas it deserves, underpinning the more emotional story beats and elevating the most intense climactic action sequences. Woody Jackson's work masterfully reflects the equally heartbreaking and chest-pounding story of Arthur Morgan, as well as breathing even more life into this already unbelievably immersive world. It's almost impossible to properly compare these two scores. They're crafted specifically for their respective games and are thus unlikely to work as effectively in other contexts. The only methods I can suggest for you folks watching is either to pay attention to the music the next time you play these games, or to listen to each soundtrack in isolation. In any case, I'm not going to give points for the soundtracks, because I think that comes entirely down to subjective opinion. These are two excellent pieces of work from very successful and talented composers. I personally prefer the soundtrack in God of War, but it's possible that might just be a symptom of me preferring the fantastical setting and story as well. Let's move on to sound design. Again, both games excel in this area. Red Dead's open world is filled with the sound of horses' hooves, bird calls, distant voices, howling winds, and occasional gunfire. Not a single thing feels out of place, and every action you take as Arthur is punctuated by an appropriate and often satisfying sound effect. It's the same in God of War. Every swing and throw of the Leviathan Axe sounds meaty and is accompanied by a guttural grunt from Kratos. Every enemy strike is telegraphed with its own unique sound, and every realm has an ambience different from the last. To be honest, I don't really have much to say in terms of comparison for this section. I just wanted to bring up the excellent scores and sound design for these two games, but there's no way I can call one better than the other in this regard. I will mention, however, that Jormungandr's voice is a standout experience and is so fitting for his immense size. He's just so goddamn cool. Both of these games are RPGs, and they both feature combat, looting, crafting, and exploration. While the implementation of these concepts are quite different between the games, they are nonetheless comparable features. I've already talked at length about how combat, looting, and exploration feel in both games, but let's talk about their design, and how they serve the evolution of the characters you play. There are three main categories of resources available to you in God of War. There's hack silver, which is the game's currency, used to purchase materials, consumables, items, and as a fee for crafting at Brock and Sindri's workshops. Then there's Idun apples and horns of blood mead, which after collecting three, increase your maximum health and rage respectively. Then there's crafting materials, and there are heaps of these, but they're area and enemy specific, so you have to kill certain bosses or go to certain side areas to collect some of these. Hack silver can be found out in the open world in chests, on the bodies of dead enemies, in random destructible containers, and gained from selling artifacts to the Super Dwarf Brothers. The Iden Apples and Horns of Bloodmead are found in specific Nornia chests, locked until you solve the corresponding axe-throwing puzzles. Some crafting resources, as I mentioned earlier, are found through combat, such as Ancient Hearts or Chaos Flames. Others are found in specific locations, such as the Lake of the Nine, or in loot chests, or from hidden treasures. These resources are used at the Dwarf Workshops and can be spent to fashion armor and talismans. You can also upgrade your weapons, upgrade your armor, and upgrade your enchantments. But what are enchantments, and what do these upgrades do, and why would you do any of it? Well, Kratos has six stats that can be improved. Strength, Runic, Defense, Vitality, Luck, and Cooldown. These pretty much do what you think. 
All of your gear has different levels of some or all of these stats, allowing you to choose which ones you want to boost the most for your build. Gear also has specific mechanics and attributes, such as a low or high perk activation chance for an effect to occur, or simply a resistance to a damage type, and so on and so forth. There are 30 armor sets in the game, all with variants in both their stat bonuses and their inherent traits. Some require far more specific and rare materials to craft, such as the Blazing Magma set, which requires resources from Musfelheim Trials. When you upgrade your armor, you upgrade the stat bonuses, but you also upgrade how many enchantment sockets they have. Enchantments are further bonuses along the same vein as armor, with boosts to stats, as well as unique passive to create a further niche. You'll end up with heaps of enchantment sockets, so your build becomes highly customizable by endgame. Then there's talismans, which are unique items with powerful activated effects on long cooldowns. These can also be upgraded with crafting resources and hack silver. Upgrading your weapons with either Frozen Flames or Chaos Flames gives a big stat boost to the weapon's primary stat, but doesn't contribute to build variety. We also have XP. You don't gain XP just to level up like in other RPGs. Instead, you use it to choose specific combat techniques and abilities to unlock. You spend it like a resource, but you don't have to go anywhere to do it. There's a talent tree for each weapon, including Atreus's bow, and there are some really cool abilities to find and create combos with. Then lastly, we have the runic attacks and summons. These are strong, special abilities on long cooldowns that you find out in the world, and can also upgrade with XP. You can slot two into each of your two weapons, one light attack and one heavy. Atreus also gets a slot of runic summons, where he can summon different runic animals to help you out. These can really turn the tides of a tough fight, so you want to choose them well and upgrade them fully, but the important thing is here that again there's quite a few with very different styles and uses, so yet another opportunity to carve out your build. There's an insane amount of options and playstyles you can build into and mess around with in this game. Not to mention there are so many viable armor sets and runic attacks that you're never forced into something specific. I really enjoy the crafting system here. There's a lot that goes into it on paper, and there are heaps of different crafting resources, but in-game it's a lot smoother than you might think. You don't have to manage your resources, nor do you have to go through some complicated process just to get a piece of gear. You go to Brock and Sindri, see what you're able to make or upgrade, and if you can, you're all good. If you can't, you can see what you still need to collect and how much is required. This system also makes exploration and side content seem a lot more rewarding, as simply seeing the beautiful new areas is great and possibly enough for some people, but having this sense of significant progression in your power level is an excellent incentive. It doesn't hurt that each armor set has a completely different look, so it doesn't just feel different to use, you can see the changes you've made to your build as you craft new pieces. This happens with weapon upgrades too. Your Blades of Chaos start out rusted and worn from lack of use, but when you upgrade them fully, they become shiny and pristine once more. Arthur isn't exactly a god, so it wouldn't make much sense for him to have the exact same options for upgrading his personal power level, but let's take a look at what he does have. You can collect different weapons and weapon types. You have three core character stats to improve. You have horses to find and bond with. You have a crafting system that can affect all of the above. Broadly, your combat experience will come down to your current arsenal of guns, bows, and throwables. You have slots for sidearms like revolvers and pistols, long arms like rifles, repeaters, shotguns, and bows, and melee and throwable weapons like dynamite, throwing knives, and hatchets. These all have different levels in five core stats. Damage, range, rate of fire, accuracy, and reload speed. Obviously, something like a sniper rifle is going to have a high damage and range, but low rate of fire, so they've done a good job balancing the weapons and making it obvious which ones should be used for which circumstance. There's a fair few weapons available, but many of them don't feel tangibly different beyond being able to kill someone in one body shot instead of two. That being said, throughout the game you'll find and buy more weapons that you'll be able to keep on your horse or person to fill your personal firearm desires. Red Dead 2 has weapon degradation, so those stat values will actually go down as you use your weapons, and you'll have to use some gun oil to clean and maintain your arsenal every now and then to keep it all performing how you want it to. This mechanic is... fine. I don't think it adds much to the game beyond an extra momentary sense of realism and possible frustration, but it plays into the weapon stats mechanic, I guess. And where there are weapons, there must be ammunition. 
There are five different kinds of ammunition for revolvers, pistols and repeaters, eight for rifles, four for shotguns and six different kinds of arrows. These have different effects. High velocity pierce multiple enemies, split points drain dead eye slower, and explosive are self-explanatory. Some of these are bought from vendors or looted from bodies, and others can only be crafted, like split points and explosives. I suppose it's a good time to talk about the crafting system. Crafting is done at campfires, which is a nice and immersive touch. You pull your horse over to a quiet, corpse-riddled field, you set up camp for the night, then you spend three consecutive real-life hours cutting the tips of your bullets into split points. In addition to special ammunition and other various weapons, you can also craft bitters, miracle tonics, health cures, and snake oils which restore and fortify Arthur's stats. Crafting weapons and ammo generally uses animal parts and base versions, meaning it's another reward for pursuing side content and it's always fun to see what you can make with what you've collected. Crafting tonics and elixirs requires herbs, and those you have to pick from the wild. I like the crafting in Red Dead too. Don't get me wrong, it's not very deep, but it gets the job done. It's not overwhelming, it doesn't impair you too much if you don't do it, but it's noticeable if you do. Annoyingly, it does take a metric wagon load of time to make more than a single item, god forbid to cook meat, but everything has a nice little animation, and again, you can choose not to do it if you find it tedious. Now I said you can deck Kratos out in a bunch of wacky and downright sexy armor options, but what about Arthur? There are 67 outfits and over 120 distinct articles of clothing for Arthur to prance around in and cover in mud. Some of these are earned as you progress through the story, while others can be bought from stores in the various cities throughout the map. Some particular outfits, like the Bulldogger or the Kenny Rogers, require you to have a high honor level before you can even purchase them, so I guess if you want to look like a good boy, you have to act like a good boy. There are also trapper outfits, which is essentially your method of crafting clothes from hunting big ass animals. If you have the right pelts and the right amount of doubloons, you too can look like this. You can create custom outfits out of disparate clothing items and save them for later use, adding a bit of convenience and customization. It's a pretty good system too, because there are plenty of different styles to choose from, and only some of them look painfully goofy. The last part of this section comes down to Arthur's personal stats, health, stamina, and deadeye. These are core components of the game. Each of these core stats are improved by performing a related task in-game, such as rowing to level up health, or sprinting to level up stamina. There are also challenges that you can complete that not only max out your stats, but also give you special clothing sets which boost them even further. So I know that part of a role-playing game is the role-playing, and you have more narrative agency as a player when you're taking control of Arthur, but I think God of War absolutely crushes this category. Not only are the crafting, gear customization, and character improvement systems more rewarding than Red Dead, they're also better incentivized. Leveling up Deadeye or finding a new badass outfit to immediately soil is good and fun, but the tangible, material difference those things make in God of War make it a more satisfying experience to engage with. The gathering of materials to upgrade your current gear and craft new gear also provides a better incentive for pure exploration. As I said, both games provide a solid basis for wanting to explore from a visual and immersion standpoint, but God of War has the edge in providing in-game rewards. That's not always needed, but it is always welcome. To put it into context, you can theoretically go through all of Red Dead and never interact with the crafting system or stat leveling systems and you will never be punished for it. The things that really matter are shooting and ammo conservation. If you try to pull that shit in God of War, you will get slapped around. The good thing about that is that the game doesn't just push you towards these mechanics because you need to survive. This progression unlocks more options, but also more fun. It's not just good utility to find another runic attack, it's fun to try it out on the next group of enemies you see. It's satisfying to use, it's epic to watch. Say what you want about enemy variety, but the devs really knew how to make rewarding RPG elements. But what about once you've crafted everything you can, explored everything the game told you to, when you've yeed your last whore? What then? 
This category will matter more to some than others, and it's probably the most subjective one yet, so I'll try to justify my choices with my own opinions as well as the facts of each game's design. When you finish all of the story missions in Red Dead, you can continue playing as John Marston, roaming and exploring as you could before with no TB to worry about. If you want to play through it all again, you'll have to start fresh. There's no New Game Plus, so you won't keep any of your gear or weapons or beard, but if you're wanting to play it again, you're unlikely to be doing it just to keep those things anyway. One of the main draws of Red Dead 2 in the first place is the immense emotional story. On replaying this narrative, you know where it's headed. You know all the twists and turns and betrayals coming your way, but it's both long and engaging enough for that not to be a problem. If experiencing a story more than once was always boring, no one would ever reread their favourite book, or rewatch their favourite movie, or cycle through every season of The Office every few months like a psychopath, Brie. Seeing Arthur's journey unfold, helping it happen, it's always cathartic no matter how many times you've done it before. You get a new perspective on the characters at the start of the story, knowing where they end up later. Dutch's wild desperation becomes heartbreaking instead of inspirational. Micah's unfettered dickheadery becomes twice as unbearable, and you'll be making good use of the antagonize function. It's not just about repetition though. Playing through RDR2 again gives you a chance to make different choices. If you had high honor in your first playthrough, maybe you can be an outlaw in your second. See what happens when you don't give a shit. You can pursue side content and main content in different orders, explore things you never got around to the first time. The game has two distinct endings, so that's always a big incentive to go through it again and see what you missed out on. As I said, there's no content specifically crafted for multiple playthroughs, but that doesn't mean it's not worth playing again. After all, I've just spent a long time talking about the sheer volume and quality of the content that exists in this game. God of War is a different story. On August 20th, exactly four months after the game's release, a new Game Plus mode was added to God of War. This mode brought both the ability to start over again with all of your current unlocked abilities, weapons and upgrades, but also brought new gear to craft and find, new attack patterns for enemies, and new resources. There's an argument to be made for experiencing God of War's story more than once, just like Red Dead 2. It's a compelling narrative, and you will see things differently once you have all the information, but it certainly offers less variety in this department than Red Dead does. There's only one ending, you can't make character decisions in-game, and there's nowhere near as many ways to get sidetracked. With the New Game Plus mode, however, playing through God of War again becomes a significantly different experience. If you choose your difficulty well, enemies are not only not boring fodder the second time around, they actually become more enjoyable to fight. They learn new techniques, they become more powerful, they present a rising threat to combat the fact that you are so much more powerful now than you were when you journeyed through the first time. This is especially clear with the Valkyries, who were always difficult, but in New Game Plus, are serious bosses. The new material you'll be wanting in New Game Plus is Scap Slag. It's used to create the new armor sets, like the armor of Ares, as well as talismans and new level upgrades for gear. You'll find it in a similar manner to how I described finding resources earlier. It's in chests, it's given to you at certain points in the story, and it's also earned for killing certain enemies, closing realm tears, and completing Musfelheim trials. You'll need a lot of it to craft all the new shiny gear they added, so again you're incentivized to explore and pursue that side content, and even though you might not get a choice in how Kratos plays into the narrative of these side activities, New Game Plus does a good job of keeping it interesting. You're unlikely to want to do all of the Niflheim, Musfelheim, and wider Midgard bits and pieces too many times, but there's more than enough intrigue and excitement for the additions to pull you along a lot further than just the main story. So what's the verdict here? As I said, this category is pretty subjective. Everyone has their own reason for either wanting or not wanting to replay a game. Having played through both games many times myself, I can say that I personally think replaying God of War is a more enjoyable experience. The way they've implemented New Game Plus is super impressive. No one had to pay for access, and they didn't even have to do it in the first place. It's just the cherry on top of an already amazing game. It allows you to further carve out your own unique build, gives you way more options to try on your second journey, and even allows you to access some places far earlier than you otherwise would have with the Blades of Chaos early on. There are many people who prefer Red Dead's world, Red Dead's characters, Red Dead's story. I totally get that opinion, and if that's the case then maybe replaying Red Dead will be more enjoyable for them. 
I will say, however, that once you've already experienced the story, there's no denying that it becomes a little less exciting. This is true for both games, but if you take the novelty of each story away, what you're left with is very different. For Red Dead, it's a lot of varied side content in an amazing open world, but it's also slow and janky gameplay that might not be as easy to hide behind a compelling narrative as it was the first time. For God of War, it's a narrower field of content, but it's all still really fun to play, and you're given more gameplay tools and incentives than in Red Dead. I'm not expecting everyone to agree on this category, but I'm giving the point to God of War. It's not as close as some of the other categories to me either. Not because it's not fun to replay Red Dead, but I just think there are so many more reasons to justify replaying God of War. The last reason I want to touch on is actually because it has less content. Replaying through all of Red Dead is a huge commitment. I know you don't have to finish the story every time you start a new save file, but if you do, it's still more than twice as long as God of War. God of War is still pretty long, but it's a much more contained experience, and one that lends itself to shooting through it in a few days or over the course of a week or two if you just want to see the story beats and spectacles again. That brings us to the end of my categories. There are more things I could compare, like endgame states and activities, immersion, main character, sex appeal, but I've already touched upon some of those points already, and I do have to end the video somewhere. I also didn't talk about Red Dead Online. There are a few reasons for that. Firstly, I wanted to focus on the single player campaigns to give as close a comparison as I could. Secondly, I've never played Red Dead Online, so I'm not really qualified to judge it all that much. Lastly, Red Dead never really gave me a reason to want to play online, so I had very little incentive to include it in this video. I kind of spoiled the season finale in the title. You already know what conclusion I'm going to reach here. I think God of War 2018 deserved Game of the Year. I think in many ways Red Dead is a more impressive game, and it may be better in many aspects, but I also think that overall God of War is more enjoyable and a more universal experience. I've spent a lot of time in this video justifying why I believe this is the case, but allow me to present a few more arguments now that you have all the information. I said I thought Red Dead won out on story. That's a huge part of these narrative-driven games, obviously. For a lot of people, that'll be the most important part. For me, it's really important. But at the end of the day, games are made to be played. I think God of War's story is really good. That was a close category. You know what wasn't? Gameplay. God of War is so much more fun to physically play, and that's way less subjective than a lot of the other factors. Controlling Kratos always makes you feel like a warrior, a legend, a god. He moves and fights with such gravitas that even if, like me, you've never played the previous entries in the series, you can tell what kind of a life he's led and how powerful he really is. Controlling Arthur, on the other hand, makes you feel like you're hopping back several console generations and also in a personal fight with the developers. As I said, mounted movement is great and it feels super free. Walking on foot? is inexcusably bad. I also think that God of War is more impressive from an artistic sense. The graphics might be strictly better in Red Dead, and there's some truly fantastic visual moments in cinematography, but the one-shot technique and the incredible art style of God of War just makes the whole experience breathtaking. Not only that, but it is a truly epic adventure from start to finish, and there are so many huge, memorable moments that simply couldn't happen in any other game. I think the most important piece of evidence for me personally was going back and replaying both of these games for this video. I enjoyed both. I really did. But I didn't enjoy them the same way or the same amount. I devoured God of War, even having done it all before. I still couldn't put it down. I wanted to explore just one more area, finish just one more quest, go back and see all the locations again, fight my way up the Muspelheim Trials. I didn't get that same feeling from Red Dead. I know I already mentioned replayability, but even just thinking about these two games in isolation, I know which one I'd rather play. I'm not going to retread everything I've said, because you heard my in-depth opinions earlier in the video. Both of these games are monumental achievements by their respective teams. I love both of them for so many reasons, and not everyone will agree with the conclusions I've drawn. But only one could ever win Game of the Year, and I think it went to the game that deserved it more.